and other people in the room. Thank you so Wonderful. much for having me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And time is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, without further ado, I've prepared um, uh, a PowerPoint, which I would like to share with you. Um, so this is based on research that I've been uh, carrying out over the past two years. Uh, it's currently, I wrote an article which is currently under review and hopefully will be published either later this year or early next year. Um, that I've titled it Beyond the Point of No Return, the Reemergence of Indonesian Debates and Concepts of the Return of Cultural Objects. So in my work, uh, as Adam uh, kindly introduced me, um, my background is I'm a curator and historian. So I've always combined these two uh, disciplines and they sort of like overlap and merge in all of my work. Uh, so I make exhibitions, uh, I'm interested in contemporary art, uh, but I'm also a historian who still does research and um, actually uses my work in the museum field, in the, in the field of art also as a tool to decolonize history. Uh, so many of my activities are really centered around that um, uh, activities to decolonize history, to decolonize art, uh, etc. Uh, obviously, uh, return or repatriation of cultural objects is one of um, one of an important method to decolonize history, uh, but not the only one, as of course you you all know. Uh, so today I would like to talk about this research, which was inspired actually by all of the previous research that has been done on the history of the discourse of um, debates on repatriation between the Netherlands and Indonesia. So um, there has been uh, excellent research has been carried out in the past, uh, mostly since the early 2000s, that this really has become a field of study. Uh, I have to mention, for example, my colleagues Jos van Burden and also C Cynthia Scott, who both have carried out very groundbreaking work in the field of uh, tracing these discourses of repatriation. The only thing that I always notice, though, in these uh, in these um, types of research, not just them, but also uh, a whole number of other scholars who have been working on the on the issue, they mainly use the archives in the Netherlands uh, as their source, the National Archive in the Netherlands. Uh, for obvious reasons, of course, of accessibility, it's much easier to do your research in the Netherlands in the National Archive rather than it is to do so in uh, Arsip Nationaal in Jakarta. Um, however, I strongly believe that it does, uh, uh, it does pay if we would look also at uh, the archive in Indonesia. So for example, whenever I would trace all of the footnotes in, in the work of my predecessors working on this topic, I would, uh, they would refer to Indonesian sources, but I would never really get to the actual original source of that. So that bothered me. So that's what I basically set out to do in this uh, research. Um, it's obviously a summary, but hopefully later at one point you will be able to read uh, the article. Um, so first of all, um, the return of cult cultural objects started before, um, before independence. So already in the 1930s, uh, the Batavian Society or Batavia's Genootschap for Kunsten en Wetenschappen in Jakarta returned regalia to Bone Sultanate and the Goa Sultanate in South Sulawesi. So this was, um, there's not too much information known about these returns, but it seems that um, both Sultanates asked the regalia to be returned because they were unable to rule even as uh, puppet, puppets of the colonial regime. And that was the reason why the Batavian society de decided to actually return uh, the regalia to the former owners. But the main moment for uh, restitution or repatriation was 1949 during the Roundtable Conference in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, so this is a well-known fact. There was a draft culture agreement reached during the Roundtable Conference. There were two cultural committees set up, a Dutch one and uh, an Indonesian one. 
which merged uh, the, the Republic as well as the uh, independent states united under the BFO. So they acted as one front in these negotiations about a draft culture agreement. So what, at the, what actually was not known uh, was who actually put the issue of return on the political agenda. So there are sources in the Netherlands that point mostly to, uh, obviously to Dutch sources, but I uh, managed to retrieve archival materials in Arsip Nationaal. So that is what we see here um, in the English uh, report of the meeting that you see here on the left. Uh, we see a draft, a draft of the draft culture agreement. Uh, so in clause two, we see um, uh, in connection with the transfer of assets and liabilities to the Republic of United Indonesia as a consequence of the transfer of sovereignty the de delegation jointly take the position the transfer must take place of A, all material assets, educational establishments, scientific institutions, and institutions of art in Indonesia. So this is basically the main, uh, the main clause. But if we don't know the Indonesian translation, we wouldn't know what it means. Material assets can refer to anything. It doesn't necessarily have to refer to cultural objects. It can, as it does in the rest of the sentence, refer to edu educational institutions, scientific institutions, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, luckily um, I found material in uh, Anri where it becomes clear what was actually meant on the Indonesian side. So here we, we see in clause two uh, that material assets was translated from Harta Benda. So this is a very clear indication that was what was meant with material assets is actually cultural objects. What we also see here is actually, uh, we see here also a note of the date. So um, we see scribbled here, 5 September, 1949. So this was very early on in the negotiations that this point was already brought up in the discussions with the Netherlands. So I will keep it short because there's more that I would like to sh share with you. The return for object quest uh, was discussed in discussions between RIS and BFO when they were aligning, on, uh, aligning their position uh, in the negotiations with the Dutch. Um, the point about the repatriation of objects was first raised by Ali Sastroami Jojo on the 9th of September in, uh, in a meeting with the Dutch uh, as part of transfer of property and assets related to art and education. So initially in the original draft, so the draft of the draft culture agreements, this article was actually not included, but only later on added as we saw in the example that I just uh, showed you. Um, and then gradually over the course of the negotiations, the point of return was sharpened by the uh, delegation, Indonesian delegation. And even uh, the evening before actual submission of the final draft agreement, uh, the Indonesian side uh, made a last uh, change. So after these negotiations, object return was actually firm on the agenda. Unfortunately, though, the draft cultural agreement never made it to the final rounds of negotiations in 1949, so it was never ratified. Um, the two parties still tried to uh, keep it alive in the early parts of the 1950s, but finally had to, finally it was rescinded in 1954. And it was only followed up later with a joint cultural agreement in 1975. So this is the actual uh, clause that ended up in the draft culture agreement. Article 19 stipulates objects of cultural value originating from Indonesia and which have come into the possession of the Netherlands government or of the former Netherlands Indies government otherwise than by reason of private law shall be transferred to the government of the Republic of the United States of Indonesia in consequence of the transfer of sovereignty from the kingdom of the Netherlands 
to the Republic of the United States of Indonesia. So this is a very clear indication that this was important to Indonesia, that cultural objects would be returned to uh, the country of their or origin. Um, so I'm showing you here a text that my uh, research assistant, Sukiyato Kurniawan, also here uh, attending today, found just actually uh, last week or even this weekend uh, about uh, how the cultural draft agreement sort of like, or the request for cultural objects continue to be a point of discussions already uh, in the early 50s. So in 1955, Mohammed Yamin already asked back for uh, the fossils of uh, uh, the first find of Homo erectus fossils uh, credited to uh, Dubois. Um, these fossils are better known as Java Man. You see them here on the right hand side. They are currently still located in uh, Museum Naturalis in Leiden, uh, but they have been requested back by the Indonesian government. And this request is uh, currently being reviewed by uh, the Dutch side. So on the uh, on the left, you see um, um, of uh, of uh, erectus for the history and science of Indonesia. So uh, these discussions about repatriation, mostly um, uh, there's not a lot of archival material uh, for the period of 1950s, 1960s that I ha have found uh, so far. Um, but we know from uh, media reports that, the, that there were still, uh, that the return of cultural objects was still important for Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia would not let go of that. So finally, in 1975, a joint cultural uh, recommendation was reached between uh, the Netherlands and Indonesia. Um, so here we read, for example, the two delegations recognize that specific objects and specimens, which are directly linked with persons of major historical and cultural importance or with crucial historical events in Indonesia should be transferred to the country of origin. So as a result of these joint recommendations, a number of collections and objects were returned to Indonesia. Uh, among them are these. Uh, in 1977, uh, a number of objects came back amongst which uh, a painting by uh, the famous painter Raden Saleh, uh, which depicts the arrest of Diponogoro, uh, dated 1856, uh, or also part of the Lombok collection uh, in the Netherlands known as the Lombok treasure was returned, um, and as well as a few other objects in relation to um, Diponogoro, the saddle of his horse, um, his umbrella, and his spear. Um, and then also on the right, we see uh, Prashna Paramita, uh, a Singosari statue, which was uh, returned in 1978. So internationally, uh, for example, also uh, UNESCO, the return of these objects have been hailed as a successful case for re of repatriation. Um, but I would argue that it, it looks successful if we look at the things that, are, that were being returned. Um, but maybe it's not so successful if we think about all the objects that didn't go back, but were actually requested and discussed. For example, the whole Lombo collection uh, was not returned, only part of that. And even a small, the smaller part of the collection was returned. Uh, also, not all of uh, Dipanogoro's objects were returned. For example, the, his Chris was not returned yet. Uh, the statues of Singosari Temple, uh, only Prashna Paramita came back, but there are actually seven other objects in uh, the Netherlands at the time. Um, not even mentioning that there are actually hundreds of thousands of objects in the Netherlands taken from Indonesia, and that's in the Netherlands alone. We also know uh, the famous Raffles collection in the British Museum, of course, and across Europe, Cape Hanley, uh, the World Museum in Vienna, and uh, of course, many other museums have objects from Indonesia. 
so these are um, uh, the Singosari statues, the remaining Singosari statues. So Prashna Paramita came back, but these are statues as exhibited in the Museum of Ethnology in Leiden, um, as presented uh, for a long period of time. Um, and over the past, I would say, decade, restitution methods really have gained momentum. And especially, I think, over the past, uh, I would say, three years, um, that uh, repatriation uh, methods really have become very important, not just in the Netherlands, but also in Indonesia. Um, so we see that in 2019, uh, a collection of Museum Nusantara in Delft was returned. Uh, and then in 2020, also the Chris of Dip Prince Dipanogoro was finally, re finally returned after having been lost for 200 years in the storage spaces of the Museum of Ethnology in Leiden. Um, I must say that uh, the Netherlands has worked quite hard to, uh, to move in this respect. So uh, an independent advisory committee on the national policy uh, no, developed a national policy framework for colonial co collections, which we see here on the left, um, uh, which um, advised the Dutch government for a more proactive approach looking into their collections and also a more proactive approach towards the return and repatriation of collections. Um, so, and on the right hand side, you see um, a uh, the final report of the pilot project, uh, provenance research on objects of the colonial, uh, of colonial objects collected in colonial context, which was also uh, aimed at advising policymakers about colonial collections in the Netherlands. Meanwhile, uh, the um, uh, advice uh, for colonial collections has been ratified in the Netherlands. So it's now official government policy since, uh, if I'm not mistaken, last year. So this is now government policy that really takes a proactive approach to the return of, uh, of objects. Meanwhile, in Indonesia in 2021, uh, Indonesia was proactive as well and set up uh, a repatriation team uh, for uh, collections um, from Indonesia in the Netherlands. So the mandate only concerns uh, Indonesia. Uh, this repatriation team is set up under the Ministry for Culture, for Education, Culture, Research and Technology and falls under the responsibility of the Directorate of Culture. Um, so already in 2021, this repatriation team was in place uh, and um, Later, or later, I will get back to uh, what happened with like a Dutch uh, repatriation team. Um, so um, there is now actually a G2G mechanism because the policy has been, the advice has been turned into a real policy. Uh, there was already uh, the repatriation team on the Indonesian side. So this, there is a proper G2G mechanism in place that really provides unprecedented opportunities for return. Um, we also need to uh, take into account that this mechanism is a G2G one, though so there is no mechanism in place yet for the return of objects to subnational or source communities, uh, for example, on the regional level or level or um, uh, yeah, source communities. Um, it does create a lot of uh, pot um, potentialities for agency to be able to create and recreate meanings for lost heritage. Um, we also take into account that return is not the only solution, but research uh, and knowledge development is also very crucial. The physical return is not the only solution, but like really uh, generating new knowledge about objects in the Netherlands and also access is very important in uh, the process of repatriation. Um, I would also say that even despite the that there is no mechanism in place for return on the regional or subnational levels, um, it is at the same time also an opportunity to sort of circumvent bureaucratic national mechanisms. Uh, regional museums could still reach out to uh, museums uh, in the Netherlands that would have a private collection or uh, 
a regional collection or other collections that do not fall under the national collections. So, uh, so the G2G mechanism is uh, currently the dominant mechanism, but it's certainly not the only way uh, to get objects back. So last year, um, in October 2021, um, here we see on the left, uh, uh, Papuja, the head of the Indonesian repatriation team, who announced um, <clears throat> the request, Indonesian request to Indonesia. <clears throat> so there are eight collections that were requested back, the Pitamaha collections, uh, the reign of Prince Diponogoro's horse. We saw that the saddle had been returned, but the reins were not part of that. Uh, also, uh, the uh, what is known as the Dubois collection, including um, the what is known as the Java Man, also the Chris Puputang Klungkung, uh, the remaining Singosari statues, uh, as well as the remaining uh, collection uh, uh, taken during the Lombok expedition. Uh, also the Luo, Luo regalia. So we saw that in the 1930s, Bona and Goa already received the regalia back, uh, but the Luo, Luo were already uh, returned, um, requested back in 1975, but never came back. Um, number eight, the Quran of Toko Umar was based on the new proven provenance research produced by the pros, uh, by the pros team uh, and is a new item on the list. So this was announced last year in October. Uh, and then uh, a month later, the Netherlands appointed an advisory committee. Um, so uh, under the chairman uh, chairmanship of Lillian Gonsalves Ho Kang Yu, uh, in addition, uh, there were the members Laura van Broekhoven, Remco Raben, and Alicia Schrikker, who also um, took part, uh, became part of the advisory committee in the Netherlands. So now uh, the Indonesian repatriation team really had uh, a counterpart uh, to talk uh, about uh, the requests that were already submitted uh, actually in July uh, and publicly announced by Papuji in October. And uh, this year in uh, July, um, the news broke that made headlines that the Netherlands were to return looted objects, not just to Indonesia, but also Sri Lanka, because the policy in the Netherlands is not just for Indonesia, but applies to all former colonies of Indonesia. So also, for example, Sri Lanka, Suriname um, uh, are also entitled to request uh, the return of objects. So um, on the 10th of July, um, um, uh, a technical agreement was signed between the two countries um, that basically makes it possible to, uh, to put the mechanism in place that Indonesia can request objects back. And um, there is a whole procedure for that. So the Indonesia can request objects that will need to be taken into a kind, uh, need to be considered by the Dutch, uh, by the Dutch advisory committee who will then make an advice to the state secretary whom we see in the, uh, in the image uh, on the left. Um, and then um, in the end, it's her decision uh, whether to uh, grant the request or not. Uh, the committee looks at two, uh, two points. So the first point is how uh, objects were came, um, actually came to, to, the, to the Netherlands as loot or under unequal circumstances, illegally acquired, et cetera, et cetera. The second point of consideration is if, for example, the provenance cannot be uh, established satisfactorily, then there's also the second criteria to consider um, where uh, the object is most valuable in terms of history, cultural, culture, culture um, social meanings, uh, scientific, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are the two only criteria that uh, the Netherlands needs to take into consideration. Uh, all uh, returns are unconditional. So there is no stipulations on how to take care of things or whatsoever. It's uh, the returns and repatriation of objects are unconditional. So what is being returned this year uh, are 
four Singosari statues, uh, also the Pitamaha collection, uh, the, Lombo, the remainder of the Lombo collection, as well as Chris Klunkung. Uh, the other items on the list are still under consideration of uh, the advisory committee in the Netherlands. So uh, here we see the result of that. Uh, just last August, I was part of a team that um, uh, that traveled to the Netherlands to uh, prepare the transport of the four Singosari statues, which we see here in their previous condition on the left. Uh, after the signing of the transfer on the 10th of July, the statues were removed. And on the right, you see the result of that. So the museum left uh, the exhibition intact for now. The red labels were the former exhibition texts uh, explaining the objects. And now uh, they added another text uh, in the black label, uh, which explains that um, these objects have now been transferred and returned uh, to Indonesia. <laughs> so um, after, uh, the transport, after we arranged the transport, the Singosari statues arrived safely in Indonesia and they uh, and there was a special event to sort of like a meet and greet with the uh, Archa, with the statues uh, on the 22nd of August, um, just last month. And this is a video that I would like to share uh, with you as a last, um, as, as my last slide with a message from the minister. So this is what I prepared for you today and wanted to share maybe as a last uh, note is that um, as uh, some of you may or may not know that uh, last Saturday evening, uh, the National Museum in Indonesia, uh, of Indonesia in Jakarta uh, was partly on fire. Um, so this is very, very sad and tragic news, but um, we are very happy that the four statues, the four Singosari statues uh, are safe. Uh, the museum consists of three buildings, uh, uh, one of which and only the the part at the at the back was on fire and luckily uh, the statues that came back uh, remained unaffected. Um, so thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any of your questions or comments. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Sadia. Um, we might have time for, let's say, one very quick question, uh, if anybody has one. Uh, should I speak? Yes, <laughs> you're being recorded in, in Sunday. Uh, in right. Hi, Sadia. This is Panga. Um, Hi, Panga. Hi, uh, Ma. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned earlier about the government-to-government uh, -government mechanisms, and also, but also at the need of involving the uh, social community. So, uh, 
Based on your observation, is there immediate possibilities to actually include uh, the uh, source community into the, uh, the discussion of the returns, such as, like, you mentioned there is a Plumpum uh, Chris that was being returned, there's a Plumpum Palace in Bali that is still alive today, uh, so we might actually import them. So uh, is that already being done, or is, is it, we need to talk about this in the future? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. I think it's a it's a very uh, valid one, and I think it's something that is becoming imp increasingly important. I think in Indonesia, also because the repatriation team is there now, and we are starting to book results uh, of getting objects back. Um, I think this really has to do also with you know um, coloniality, uh, power structures that are sort of like taken over that were put in place by the colonial. Uh, governments, but have been taken over by uh, by the Indonesian nation state. Uh, this is indeed something that the G2G mechanism does not cater to. So the the collections objects come back from a national connect collection and enter uh, the Indonesian national collection. Um, so uh, this is a point of discussion. So the repatriation team is actually in discussion or in conversation with many, uh, with, for example, the family, the Klung Kung family. Um, there were also discussions, for example, with communities in Lombok uh, about the Lombok collections where a number of organizations and community groups were gathered where we discussed on um, the future of these collections. I think for uh, the making of new meanings, I think these type of discussions are crucial uh, for uh, these objects to come back and also have a relevant uh, and new life in uh, in Indonesia, where um, the the power structures that were in place at the time that these objects were taken away no longer exist. So there is not to, in my view, there is not um, not a clear solution to this, except that we can only continue these conversation in an open and a transparent way. Thank you very much, Sadia, for your really fascinating presentation. Uh, one final round of applause.